find things that that are still harder for them. How do you overcome like if a, if a dog just doesn't want to do that piece of equipment or is it, or refuses to do, do that? How do you overcome that? With training. So um, one good example is my Odyssey. She was the number one ranked uh, otter hound in agility in the U.S. from 2009 to 2016 when she retired. Um, after age 11, she had her last run. And uh, she hated the teeter. Her entire um, career, she hated the teeter. And so I would get her okay on the teeter and then we would be at a trial and if something would happen, it was a teeter she didn't like and we'd have to start all over again. And so for her, it was really just figuring out the best way to, um, to break it down. So in the very beginning, the two issues she had with the teeter were the two aspects of the teeter, which are movement and noise. So it, it moves on them and then it slams down and it makes a loud banging noise most of the time. And she hated both of those. So we started out working with just the noise issue. So I had my, one of my trainer, trainer friends would be on the teeter across the building where we were training. And I would have Odyssey as far away as I could. And she would just stand there and bang it back and forth. And I would just keep giving her food until she got used to it. Um, and then we would move closer and closer until she could be next to the teeter and it could bang down and she didn't mind. Um, and then the movement part of it is something that a lot of dogs will have issues with. And for her, it was just finding something that motivated her to go over it. Um, most of the time that was going to be whipped cream. <laughs> so, um, you know, if I put whipped cream on the end of it, she'd run to the end to get the whipped cream and she would forget the fact that it was moving. So, <laughs> you know, you have to be a little bit creative at times. <laughs> That's beyond creative. That's ingenious. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but so her whole career, we would, she would, you know, she ended up with um, master bronze titles, which means that she qualified in master standard, um, which is all of the equipment, including the teeter. Um, I think she had like 26 times that she qualified in that over the course of her career, which um, I was very proud of. I, you know, that was the most that any of my dogs had done. Um, so she was able to do it, but she just didn't always like it. <laughs> That's amazing. And I got a chance to watch Odyssey perform and you never would have known that she had a problem with, with any of that because she was very fun to watch. That's, I, was, I was amazed to uh, watch the two of you as a team. That was really cool. Um, so tell us if you would a little bit about, I know you've done agility with other breeds. So can you tell us how it dif differs between an otter hound and other breeds of dogs that you've done agility with? So I started my agility career with Tony, my first otter hound, and I quickly learned that it was very difficult for me to learn to run agility with a dog that didn't know how to run agility either. So I borrowed my sister's golden retriever for a couple of months. Her name was Deli, and she was running in masters in the highest level. And so I went from being a very novice handler to going and having to run Deli in masters and Deli the Golden taught me when I was messing things up, how I should do things different. She would actually bark at me. She'd stop at the course and bark at me when I would mess up. <laughs> and everybody on the outside knew that I was running, you know, my, my niece. And uh, they would say, that's right, Deli, tell your Aunt Joey what she did wrong. And that's so good. Deli taught me a lot. And then over the course of the years, I've run, uh, I have a border collie who runs to get I ran her dad radar a lot. I've run a lot of my sister's shep uh, German shepherds. Um, they're very different to run than otter hounds, uh, depending on the which dog it is. So the border collies are really, really fast and you have to, it's a different challenge there, keeping up with them and directing them where to go. Um, but it's a lot easier because they have a more of a natural drive for it. Uh, they want to please you. Otter hounds don't really care if you're pleased or not so <laughs> that's one of my problems with that around <laughs> right <laughs> that's a, that's what I love about them though is that you know if they're doing it they're doing it because they want to do it so um you know they don't they're not doing it because you want them to do it and they want you to be happy they're doing it because they actually want to do it so um that you know with the with the other dogs there there are other challenges but um my, I prefer to run the otter hounds just because 
you know, I don't know. For me, it just doesn't mean anything running a border collie. Anybody can run a border collie. Otter hunts definitely have more of a wow factor, at, at least for the audience, for anybody watching. It's kind of like, you can't watch an otter hound do agility and not go, wow, that's amazing. Because you see border collies do it all the time. It's like, yeah, 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 it's a border collie. But to watch an otter hound, it's like, wow, that's an otter hound. I know with black Russians too, it's like, holy cow, that's a black Russian. For those of you who don't know, I'm, I also breed uh, black Russians and I've been in black Russians for a lot longer than otter hounds. So I kind of have a tendency to compare the two breeds. Um, so what's your personal favorite thing about agility? I love the, the, um, the relationship that you develop with the dog. And, um, you know, I, I, I say that they don't do anything just for you. Odyssey did a lot just for me. And, um, Aww. sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, we all understand that. She it's was okay. an amazing dog, but I love the relationship that you build with them. Yeah. And, uh, to be able to communicate with them, especially in a situation like that, where, you know, we go out and we walk the course ahead of time. So we know where we're going. They have no idea. They show up there blind and they have to figure out what we're trying to say. And it's not always easy. And lots of times you'll sit in the outside the ring and you'll watch somebody and you'll say, gosh, I walked that course and I still didn't know where they were going. So, you know, it, the, the dogs are pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but that relationship is my favorite thing about agility. And they totally rely on you to tell them what to do. And a lot well, of you <laughs> so most of the time, sometimes they choose what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tom will appreciate this as well. My first otter hound, Tony, um, in the beginning, it took him a lot. It took us two years. We showed about um, three out of four weekends a month. And so we did a lot of trialing and it took two years before we actually finished a course together. Because we would sit at the start line, Tony would look around the course, he'd look for all the tunnels. I would say, okay, let's go do the first, whatever it was, Tony would take off and go run, do every tunnel on the course, and then come back to me and be like, okay, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, yeah, it can, uh, they, they, they're, they're definitely challenging, but, but it's fun too. You know, once we, we were able to figure out one day a light bulb went off and he was like, Oh, you're here for a reason. I said, yes, Tony, I am here for a reason. So. And I've been trying to tell you the reason for a while now. A long time, but. <laughs> Thank you for finally figuring that yeah, out. That's just Tony. That's very cute. Um, so tell us, Joey, are there any things, so say we want to get it started in agility, is there any things that we should be watchful of or careful about or pitfalls to avoid? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that, uh, that the biggest things are um, making sure, especially with our puppies, that we're not doing too much too soon. And um, I, have, I had a run of, of dogs um, that I raised who had elbow issues. And I really believe it was because I was doing too much. Well, I shouldn't say elbow issues. They came back, their elbows were radiographically not normal. Um, they were able to run agility and do everything that we wanted to do their whole lives, but their elbows were not normal. And um, I think it was because I did too much with them as puppies. And so, you know, we have to be careful about the pounding and so even though we may not be jumping them, there are other things that we're doing with them that are very repetitive. And so you want to make sure that you're avoiding the really repetitive motions um, when they're puppies so that you're not causing any kind of joint damage. And I'm careful about that until they're about 16, uh, 18 months old. Um, you want to make sure that wherever you choose to train um, has trained breeds other than Goldens and Border Collies because otter hounds are different. And so um, people, trainers need to understand that, you know, you can't really do a whole bunch of drills if you're working on something. You, what ends up happening um, with, with me is if I'm having an issue figuring out how to handle something, if I can't get my footwork right, or I can't figure out how to get to the place, I need to do it myself and not have the dog with me until I feel like I've got it and I'm ready for the dog because my dog is going to give me one or two times doing it. My uh, Odyssey was, was notorious. She would do it how I wanted the first time. And then the second time, if I tried to repeat it, cause I wanted to, to work on something for myself, 
she would say, well, if we're doing it again, it must not have been right the first time. So I'm going to try, I'm going to throw this in here then. And each time she would do something different, which was not what I was going for. And so it always would end up that we were not successful when we could have been successful if we had stopped earlier. She so he knew. <laughs> yeah. So drilling is not something that is really great for them as a breed. Kathy, do you, do you agree with that? You're, you're on mute. Just shake your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that that's something that's different with otter hounds is that you really want to, you know, watch how often you're asking them to do the same thing. If you get the behavior that you want and it's perfect, just stop. You, you did good. It's okay that it just happened one time. That's enough for them. They are really, really fast learners. They learn things so quickly um, that you really don't have to continue to drill things. I would go back to it, you know, later and repeat it. And at that point, after you've done other things and say, you know, just to make sure that they do understand and it wasn't a fluke that it happened. Um, but they, they do learn very quickly. Good to know. Um, are there anything, so other than like the, the uh, exercise and the um, learning part of it and next, you know, getting their brain involved and stuff, is there any other things about agility that makes it particularly good for an otter hound? Well, I think that the, the brain and the interaction with the people, with, the, with their person is really good for everybody, for all breeds in agility. Um, getting an otter hound to have their nose up off the ground and being able to focus on something that's not nose related is a challenge, but I think it's actually something that's really good for them to learn. And I work on and I believe a lot in uh, teaching self-control um, and so there's a lot of different exercises that you can do to teach puppies and, and, and older dogs self-control, self-control exercises. And um, I think once they understand the concept of self-control, it's easier for them to be in a situation like running agility where you don't want them to revert back to their natural instinct, which is to put their nose down and go sniff somewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, um, so if we're just starting agility, what would help us to get them to learn not to have their nose on the ground for this activity? So the heart that that's where you have to be more fun than sniffing, which with an otter hound can be hard. It really can be, but you have to, you have to be more exciting and more engaging than their nose is. Okay. Yep. I, I get that. And Thanks for putting it like that, because that yeah. <laughs> because uh, when I think about agility, I think, how would I ever do that? Um, so that that makes it a lot clearer. Uh, so anything that I missed, or any other suggestions you have, or information you want to share, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, I would say for the people that want to do agility, um, the the main things to to keep in mind are that you do want to work a lot on foundations. You want to go visit a whole bunch of schools in your area, whoever you can find that teaches, and see how they're teaching, and just get a feel for the dogs that are there, how they're doing. In this area, we have one particular trainer who seems to get all of the awful dogs. I don't know why they, all the bad dogs end up with her. I took a couple of classes with her. It drove me insane. So I couldn't go there anymore. So, but it would be something if you just went and watched, you would get a better feel for how the classes run and how the people respond. And um, I, I know it's shocking for those of you that know me, but I don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> and so sitting around and, and waiting while somebody doesn't listen to the instructor, it's, it's one of those things for me. But um, so go and watch, watch places that are training before you sign your dog up. Make sure that they do a lot of foundation work and um, make sure that they're treating the dogs right wherever you're training for whatever you're training for, not just for agility. But if you go into somewhere and they automatically um, slap on a prong collar or uh, an electric collar, you may want to reconsider whether or not that's the place that you want to train. Um, you guys had asked me, Robin, before we, everybody was here, how do I decide what dogs to do agility with? <laughs> and, and I said, I, I choose to do agility with all of my dogs, but not all of my dogs choose to do agility. 
So I train, I start them in basic training, I do foundation work for them, and I let them tell me whether or not they want to do it. If they want to do it, I am thrilled. I'm so happy to do it with them. And then there are some dogs, uh, like my Daria, for example, she is the most amazing dog in practice, and she will not run in a trial. She will not leave a start line in a trial. And the, my, my, my theory, who knows if it's really true, my theory is that she is just a dog that never wants to be wrong. And so if she doesn't try, she can't be wrong. And so um, I have retired her from agility no less than five times because I keep taking her out and I show her and she doesn't want to run. And so I say, okay, you're retired. You don't have to do it again. And then we're doing something in the yard and she's crazy good. She's so fast and she loves it. And I'm like, okay, I'll trial you again. And we go to her trial and she won't move. She won't leave the start line. And I, I don't learn very quickly always. So it took me five times before I said to Daria, you can run all you want in the yard. I will train you all you want, but you never have to trial. Um, and then there's other dogs like Tease who was an amazing agility dog. She was so good as a young dog. She had a bad accident um, about four months before she was ready to start trialing. And she was injured for eight to 12 months. Um, I had five different chiropractors look at her. I had a bunch of different vets look at her. Nobody could figure it out until finally somebody figured out it was her first trip. She couldn't turn her head to the side. And so she ran agility for me because I love doing agility, not because she was having fun at it. And um, she really didn't enjoy it. So she got an open jumpers title for me. And I said, you never have to do this again. So really it's listening to them and figuring out who wants to do it is the biggest part. Is there an age um, requirement to get started in agility? Like do you have to be six months old or 12 months old or something like that before you trial? To trial, in, uh, it depends on the venue. In AKC, in most venues, it's 15 months. So you're not allowed to trial before you're 15 months old. But keep in mind, at 15 months, their growth plates are still open. So I don't usually end up trialing with my otter homes until they're three or older. Oh, wow. Yep. Good to know. How yep. long does it take you for, in this average, I know it depends on the dog for sure, but how long does it take a, just on average a uh, otter hound and human team um, to train and practice before they're ready to trial, just on average? That just depends on how much you train. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't train enough, so it takes me a long time. Um, I think people that have more time to train, uh, that could be training, you know, 10, 15 minutes every day, it, they could be ready in maybe six, six months or a year. Um, but for me, it takes me longer just because I don't have enough time to train often enough. Once you've achieved, so I know like the title progression, you told us about that. So what's like the end of the line for a dog doing agility? Is there an end of the line? There's there no end of the line. Okay. <laughs> you can just keep going. So um, the champion titles are your mock, which is your master agility champion. And that's running at the regular class, which is uh, the dog is jumping the height that they measure into based on the, their withers, their shoulders. Um, you can also run four inches lower than that, and that's called a preferred class. And a champion in the preferred class is called a POC. And you, if you get your mock or your POC, you get your second one, you have a mock two and a POC two. You get your third one, you have a mock three and a POC or a POC three. And it, it just, it goes on forever. So there has never been a mock or POC otter hound. Um, the most that any dog, ha any otter hound has come, the closest any otter hound has come to a mock was my Odyssey. And she had three double Qs, which means that she qualified in masters in jumpers and standard on the same day. And she did that three times in her career out of the 26 plus times that she qualified in standard. There were only three times that she qualified in jumpers on the same day. You have to have 20 uh, double cues to get your mock and you have to have 750 speed points and so you get one speed point for every full second that you are under course time so 
if course time is 60 seconds and you run it at 52.3 seconds, then you get seven speed points. Um, so for a border collie, it's not a big deal. They usually rack up their speed points really quickly and it takes them longer to get their double cues. Um, Odyssey ended up with her three, um, her three double cues and about 350 speed points when she moved to the preferred classes. And so, 750 is a lot. It's a lot. It's it a lot. is a lot. Yeah. And then the other thing to know about um, AKC agility is that there's really two main national competitions per year. And um, one of them is the AKC Nationals, and that happens in the spring. It moves around the country. Um, An otter hound has never qualified for that. You have to have in the one year, you have to have, it changes all the time, but the most recent one was like 300 points and five double cues in one year. Not like lifetime, but in one year. <laughs> um, and so no otter hound is qualified for the nationals, but then there is the um, AKC Agility Invitational, and that happens along with the uh, Royal Canaan uh, AKC Invitational in Florida. Right now it's in Florida. It goes back and forth between Florida and California. And they invite the top five dogs of each breed. And so you can be the top otter hound in agility like Odyssey was, and you can be invited to go to the Invitational in Florida where we might not, well, we never were able to run at the National. So uh, the Invitational is a great opportunity for the more unusual breeds. And is so in agility, is there, is it judged at all or is it just certain set things that are um, disqualifying or can, like certain points that get you disqualified? So it, it's, um, it's a little bit of both. So if you, um, if you knock a bar, you're pretty much done with that run there. You can finish, but you don't qualify. Um, and so most of the things are that are like that. So if you knock a bar clearly, if you do the wrong piece of equipment clearly, you know, but it becomes more subjective when you're going to a piece of equipment and then you turn away, you know, at what point and the judge has to make a decision there as to was that a refusal or did, you know, how close were they to that before they turned away. Um, so there are some more subjective portions to judging as well. Um, but I would say it probably half and half is, you know, very clear cut, you know, your dog jumped from the top of the A-frame, it didn't touch the yellow portion at all. So that's, there's no question about it. But the question comes when they're running down the A-frame, did they put a foot in there or not? So uh, the judge is there for that. Who sets or designs the course? Does the judge do that? The judge does that. It's a different course each time. And the judge designs the course usually four or five months ahead of time and then submits it to the AKC. And each judge has a field rep, an agility field rep, and they look at it and they determine whether or not the course is sufficient for the class that they're running. So uh, for masters or excellent, you have to have a certain number of challenges that, um, and the judge will be, uh, they'll look at it and see if, if there's enough of those and if they, if they make sense or if there's anything dangerous or that sort of thing. When do you learn the, the course? Is it that day or right, right before you go on? I've seen you walk the course and stuff. Is that your first time knowing what's going to be on it or do you see it on paper first? Uh, so they'll usually put the paper courses out during the day. Uh, during, in the morning, you'll, they'll, you'll, you can pick up your paper courses uh, most of the time. Um, now they're posting it and you're allowed to take a picture of it because you're not allowed to have any more paper. But um, they, uh, so it's really, it's the first time you can see it on paper. And then once they get to that course and they set it up, you're walking it for the first time. Now with, with the COVID going on, is agility still going or is that stopped like confirmation and some of the other activities? There's a few um, going on. Tom has uh, run in a couple of trials. Um, but there aren't a whole lot of them happening right now. So I would say it's similar to confirmation where there are some people that are trying to get back to normalcy. Um, but Tom said that he was very happy with how they ran the trial. He was at where Tips got her novice fast. No, Cree got his novice fast title. So, um, that has been since COVID happened. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so when do you decide to retire a dog from agility? When they tell me that they're ready. 
that they don't really want to do it anymore. Yeah. Is there like an average age where they're just kind of done or is it just more the personality or their physical condition or? For me, it's been, it's been the, the individual dog has told me. So um, Muddy retired. He just didn't want to run anymore. He had done what I asked him to do. He didn't ever want to see another dog walk. Um, Odyssey ran until she physically couldn't run anymore. Um, you know, Tease and Daria got retired because they didn't want to do it. <laughs> So hopefully the babies that are coming up are going to be interested in uh, Dita and Tellum are, are being trained um, and that they each have their, their strengths and their weaknesses. And then, uh, and then the, the next generation is here too. So anything else that you would like to add? That's it for kind of the, my, my questions that I can think of. Anything else that you want to add or share that I, I didn't cover? I can't think of anything else. Did we get any questions? Yes, any questions. And if anybody has any questions um, that they want to talk about, um, we'll start with an open chat in a couple seconds. But first, if there's any questions um, that have been submitted by a chat, Cindy? Yes. In the age of COVID, would it be a detriment to buy some agility equipment to set up in the home and start them using that without any foundation? Yes, it would be. Um, I would not do that. I would um, make sure that you have your foundation. Um, your foundation is solid before you start using equipment. Um, equipment can be very dangerous depending on what they're doing and how they're doing it. So you want to make sure safety is the utmost concern, I think, when you're doing agility and using equipment. But there's a thousand things that you can do to, for foundation work during COVID at home. You don't even need equipment. So, you know, just start getting you, the dog used to walking with you, um, walking on both sides of you, sitting on both sides of you, um, turning away from you on each, each direction. Those are all things that you can work on without having any equipment, but those are huge foundation things that would make a huge difference when you actually get to where you can use equipment, being able to, uh, if you have the body cues figured out for the dog. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that good? That's good. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions that they want to ask? How would you train them to move away from you? With treats or, or, or toys. I use a lot of, tre of um, treat, uh, toy treats. So um, tre toys that you can put a treat into. And so... Um, if I'm teaching the dog to, to turn away from me, I'll have the dog standing, standing next to me and I toss the, the treat toy that way and then they'll go away to get it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I just want them to learn to turn away and then I wanna have them doing it on both sides where they're turning away from me. You could also just have them turn in a circle too. If you start, you know, circling next to you, but turning away is the same skill. So um, a lot of times we don't think about the skills that we're, we think about the things that the tricks that we're teaching them, not necessarily as how they're gonna work in the future, but you know, teaching them to spin in a circle each direction is a huge portion of foundation for agility because they have to turn to go to the next obstacle. Any other questions at all from anybody? You know, in this, in the day of COVID, we're all living that, but um, are there any, because if people can't get out, are there any videos that you recommend, Joey, or anything that would be on YouTube or anything that people could watch? I know AKC probably has some things as well. The AKC does have some things that you can watch. Um, I would say that um, one of the one of the best online sources would be um, what's her last name, Kathy Susan. Um, I know it like I know my own. Turn off your mute, Kathy. What is it? I got her. Okay, um, she's she's expensive though. Um, but but she. Fenzy Dog Academy online. Fenzy, Fenzy is very good. Fenzy has a lot of different agility courses that you can use online. And um, but, but Susan, is it say, is it Salo? What's her no, last name? No. Um, oh, God, I know it like I know my 
say yes is her is her website um and you can find a lot of her stuff on youtube for free so she does crate games which teaches um dogs about self-control um she does a recallers course mm -hmm. that uh <laughs> kathy's going to look it up i can't believe it i can't remember it's like it's like i know my own name um Garrett, Susan Garrett, that's her name. So um, if you look up Susan Garrett on YouTube, you can find a lot of different things that she's teaching her dogs. And she really is great at um, teaching foundation work. She also, um, she does teach mainly border collies. She does have some terriers that she trains. And so I think using the terriers is more, um, it's, I, I came up with it, it's Garrett. So. Susan Garrett, okay. Yeah. <laughs> her, her crate game video is absolutely wonderful. It will teach your dog to love their crate. Um, I, my, my rider is five years old, and, and she was really a wild child. And the way we got her um, trained, she loved her crate so much. So we would actually put her soft crate. I would have two soft crates, one... Um, in in front of an a-frame one at the other end of it and so she would she would always come back to me because her her crate was right there but this crate games video is just and i'm doing it with my new puppy and it's just wonderful he he sits he's only three months old he sits in his crate um as soon as i open the crate i open it up wide he sits and waits for me to say okay and then he zooms out. And that's my, re that's not the best release word in agility, but it's just what I'm used to. So, yeah. you know, that's what, that's what I use. But that sitting and waiting is something that they learn to do without you asking them to do it. Right, and right. that, that is the self-control aspect. And it works so well for the rest of life to have self-control uh, lessons. And He'll, he'll sit in front of a jump right now and the bars are just on the ground and I'll just tell him to stay and walk around the jump and go to the other side and turn sideways towards him. Just call his name and start to run and he goes, he just runs through the two stanchions and comes right to me and gets a treat. So there's so many things like that that you can do when they're real little. You don't even have to have a bar on the ground. You can just no, have, no. have a stanchion yeah. there. You don't even have to have a stanchion if you don't have one. You can yeah. use cones. Two, two um, yeah, yeah, anything. And, you know, um, you can use tomato steaks. I used tomato right. steaks yeah. for weave poles for the first 10 years or so that I was training agility. So, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you have around the house that you can use without having to spend a lot of money. Great advice. And a solid recall, a solid recall is just so important. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's change things. <laughs> so if we could gather some information to put into like a library for people to use as resources, Joey, could you um, maybe send some resources or Kathy or anyone that does Tom uh, to Robin? And we can, you know, to help build that library because sure. I think it's something that, you know, when people are starting something new, it's like, where do I start? I don't know where to yeah. start. And that might be helpful. Absolutely. To, to piggyback on top of that, um, thank you, Cindy, for mentioning that. Um, we will have the recording of this Otter Talk on uh, YouTube. And before I even say that, forgive me, I thought it was recording and it wasn't. So we missed the first like 12 minutes. So my apologies to everybody on that, but we will have it on YouTube. And that's something that we can add those links to you on the YouTube um, channel as well. We'll have it on the Otter, um, on the OHCA or the groups IO also, but we can't store it there. So I'll just have the YouTube link on the groups IO for, for members of the club. Um, everybody has um, access to that and it, it'll be on the um, there's an otter talk file so the link to YouTube will be in that file and also um, it's um, on the I think the channel is going to be otter talk time that's the email I've been using for invitations and stuff um, but that should be on there 
Um, also, while I'm talking about that, um, any topics that you would like to learn about, feel free to use your chat function on that to type in any um, future topics that you're interested in learning about or um, any future topics that you would like to be a panelist on. Um, like say you're the best at trimming dog toenails or something like that. You can put that in there and down the road when we have a, a grooming otter talk, we might have you as a panelist for the nail part of that or anything like that. Um, we'd like to get as many otter um, hound people from the community involved as we possibly can and have this be a resource for, for everybody in the community, not just necessarily club members, but, but everybody that has an otter hound or, or even has just a love for otter hounds. We want to um, engage all of those people. Um, and on that note, our next otter talk is going to be on the 19th of the month at 7 p.m. And that's not going to be necessarily a panel. It's going to be puppy puppy chat. So any of you that have new puppies or are anticipating getting new puppies, um, it's going to be kind of a question and answer. My puppy's doing this. Is your puppy doing that? Or how can I get my puppy to stop doing this? Or what do you suggest I do to, to do get over this challenge? Um, so it's going to be everybody is invited period all the breeders can be there or or not be there but we'd like to have as many breeders be there to offer their guidance and suggestions so joey especially your puppy people that have just gotten puppies if you'll invite as many of those people that are interested we'd love to have them um we're also going to have um allison rosenberg is going to join us on that call she specializes in puppy training and puppy manners so she wanted to be involved in that otter talk so that one is coming up on october i'm sorry um, on August 19th at 7 p.m. And then we're having our national speaker is going to be um, speaking about epilepsy and that is on August 27th. So that's not necessarily an otter talk, but it's um, something that will help um, advertise for the club. Um, so go ahead and use your, your chat bar for that. Also, you're always welcome to email me at uh, otter talk time at gmail.com with anything that comes up. So if three days from now you're thinking, oh, you know, I'd really like to learn about X, feel free to email me with what that X might be. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and open it up to any um, chat or questions right now, just an open question and answer. So feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like and any other questions that you have, now would be the time. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. This isn't really a question, but I know when I first started agility, it was getting training the dog to do the obstacles is the most fun thing. But and that, that's the easy part, getting them to do the obstacles. It's what comes in between the obstacles. You can't ever run an agility course if they're not staying with you. So that's where your foundation work comes in, like Joey talked about in between the obstacles is more important than actually learning them. And learning them is really fast. Yes, learning them comes fast. Learning them is very fast, but it's, yeah. the, it's the body cues and, and the stuff in between that takes a long time. Is that, so the body cues, is that something that you learn, learn from your instructor or class that you take? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it you learn from your instructor, assuming that they have foundation courses. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of agility places. Um, I, I have one that I go to here uh, because I've trained enough dogs that I, I know how to train that stuff without needing it. But, you know, they just do obstacles. They don't talk about the things in between. So you can end up training somewhere where they don't talk about how to get them from one ask one thing to the next. And... And if you're in that situation, go find somewhere else to train. I'm sorry, guys. My battery has just told me it's running low. I'm losing you all. Thanks, Thank Kathy. You. Bye, Kathy. Bye, Kathy. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or additions? Tom, you've done agility. Do you have anything that you would like to add? No, Joey did a great job explaining it all. She, she got me started on it and uh, everything she said. When I had Creed, I rushed him a little bit because he's the only one I had and I wanted to get going. And that was probably my mistake because I had no idea what I was doing either. But um, the biggest thing is, like our instructor, you, you can't do anything until you do an obedience course and then they do the foundation. All that's probably, as I said, the most important part is getting the dog and you to work together and whatever. 
and Creed's, Creed just loves being out there. And he just, sometimes he just kind of wants to do his own thing. And I've taken him back and really worked with it, worked with him a little bit. And he's much, much better, but he's still not perfect at it, but he just loved everything he did when he was out there and had no fear of anything. So it's, it's just a lot, it's a lot of fun, but it does take, take, take some time. So like I said, it's been three years it took to get his first title. Um, but that was fine. It was just a lot of fun with him. Yeah, All these cool. dogs. It was a great time. Now I got tips and Wiley and I just thought some of the things you like training, I always thought that training to do the weave would be, Oh my God, they're never going to get this. But it's amazing how they pick it up so quickly. And all my classes, every one of my Otter Towns picked up stuff way before a lot of other dogs. So they're very, very smart. So it, it was, it's great. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you for adding that. What did you do different then with your second dog after you learned your rush creed a little bit? Well, Tips, I took my time on a lot more and, and worked with her. Now she's kind of the opposite of creed. She, Sometimes she just really gets going and loves it. And other times, like Joey talked about, um, would just sit at the thing. I, the first time I, I took her to two trials and she got blue ribbons and did great the first two two times and qualified both times and didn't miss a thing. And I was, oh, this is great. Then I decided I'll try her on the jumpers. Of course, I took her to jumpers. She went jumped the first thing, went to the next jump and stood there. And she didn't do anything else. She wouldn't move. She would just stood there. And then I kept, come on. She, said, she just didn't want to do it. And then uh, finally we did the next thing, got her about halfway through, and then she just ran back to the gate. So all of a sudden she went from this perfect dog to now she's got a couple little quirks. So we've been working with her with treating her more between things, you know, trying to work with her a little differently and stuff like that. But she's, She's doing it really great, and Wiley is doing really well. She's having a fun time with it, and, but she's more like her mom. She kind of likes to, as Joey said, sometimes Wiley loves tunnels. So if she goes down, the first thing you say, let's go, and you jump, then she'll just run through the tunnels, and then she comes back. And some some things they just love to do, other things they're a little shaky on. But that, but, that what, what Tom's describing is exactly what Kathy said, where the obstacles are the actually the easiest thing yeah. to teach. And so teaching them to, that you're there for a reason, um, like it took so long for Tony to f figure out, um, that's the hard part is, is that. But um, there was something else I wanted to add with Tom saying, oh, that, you know, sometimes they're perfect and sometimes they're not. And I can tell you that there's, you, you can have no, no, ego when you're running an otter hound in agility um yeah. they will embarrass you every single time they will find something to do um so yeah. it is an exercise of humility you have to be prepared for it <laughs> and patience yes well oh well, it, it's so funny because just what i'll say i'll say this real quick i don't want to take too much of the time but what tips the, the third time i took her the thing was, is I had to, I moved the cages inside the, the room. It was real hot outside and I didn't want to keep it. A couple of treats through the bars and one of the treats fell between Tip's cage and Creed's cage and Tip's was staring at that tree. So when I took her out, she didn't want to do a thing and I'm going, what is this? She kept running back to the gate. So I said, oh, well, I give up. Okay. So I grabbed her and said, good girl. And you want to make it fun all the time. So we take her out. I took her back to the cage and, the, and she wanted to get to her cage so badly because she wanted to get to that tree that fell between the cages. So that was on her mind the whole time. Sure. I'm trying to do agility with it, but it didn't hit me until I, I, why is she pulling, you know, get back to the cage. And then she goes right to where that tree is and stares at it. And that was what she was thinking about. So it's, it's funny how they, they notice certain things. Um, our training class, they, they, she put up this huge fan. It's got to be about 15 feet across. It's just one big fan that goes around at the top. So Creek could care less while here, but Tips went out to the middle, and all of a sudden she noticed this fan. <laughs> and she was scared of it, and she didn't want to go out and do anything. She was looking at this fan. So it's funny how they pick certain things, and just that becomes one gets on their mind. And 
just all part all part of the the fun of having an otter hound. I think. Even even when Odyssey was was uh, running in Masters, um, she had been running for years and years, so she was really good. If she saw somebody messing with a piece of equipment before she ran. So, for example, we're sitting at the start line and they move the dog walk or, or reset something. She wouldn't do it. She absolutely yeah. would not do that piece of equipment. So it was like she said, nope, that's not safe. I'm not going to do it. Um, but it was every time. It didn't matter what it was. If it was a piece of equipment she loved or not, if somebody messed with it right before we ran, she wasn't touching it. Yeah. And, you know, they're just, they're quirky. <laughs> they have little quirks and you just got to. Go with the flow and enjoy having them out there with you no matter what. <laughs> yep. Wow. And I think sometimes, you know, you, you think, I mean, they're a big dog, but they do have some shyness. I mean, they're like, Ooh, what is that? What is that? I, I think of it more as self-preservation. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, they, they're very, most of them are very aware of their surroundings. And if their surroundings yep. change, they want to figure out what's different and is it okay? Mm -hmm. or the opposite like greedy care less yeah. <laughs> yeah my otter hound's very very temperamental that way if there's something off she's nope not doing yeah. it yeah. So, i i my experience has been the girls have been more environmentally aware than my boys have yeah That's good point there yeah yeah. Agree. Yeah. yeah yeah we have darby um can hear me or not yeah no you just muted yourself Cindy Did I? okay thanks Darby okay. is we call her Gladys because she has taken on the role our neighbors we live out in the country but our neighbors got they have an 11 month old puppy and then he's got another puppy and they're trying to train them and the puppies are always over here and she does I mean she takes control of barking at them because they're not supposed to be over here they're not you know they do they they they're warriors. It's like, you know, what's going on over here? And they, you know, I'm like, it's none of your business. It's none of your, you know, they got this. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting how they're all personalities are different. Yeah. Stuart could care less. Dan, I have to ask you if your puppy's been watching, if he wants to enjoy agility soon. Oh, you're on mute, Dan. Not sure he's the right one for agility. He's so cute. Oh. <laughs> he was he was the one that was tracking around the the whelping box when he was two days old. So he's a tracker. Oh. He's a tracking dog. Yeah. Tracking dog. There you go. He's uh he's got an amazing nose. Yeah, we've been working a lot with him on smells. He likes to smell. He's pretty good at finding us out in the yard too. Yeah. You'll have to you'll have to join us for our um scent detection and nose work otter talk that's going to be i think october 14th you have to join us for that what's this puppy's name he's 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 finn another finn, finn. great so, he's really cute he was and jose he, he was jose okay got it i don't know any of the we froze or you froze what's that what's that does anybody else have any questions for Joey or anything for upcoming Otter Talks that they want to type in or let us know? Anything else at all? I just had one quick question. Igor has been through multiple obedience classes and he's doing great and everything we've always done has been on our left hand side. I'm struggling now, and our current Obedience 2 instructor also runs Agility. Yeah. So, you know, they've told us in the Agility end, you know, if you're in Obedience, work them on the right-hand side. Any, any tips or tricks to make them ambidextrous? You just have to start doing it. And so, okay. you know, you need, you need to have them... Um, so what I'll usually do, um, if they're used to working on my left, if I want to start having them say sit on my right, I will stand next to a door and they have to come between me and the door um, so that that will keep them in that space. Um, and I will use something better than they would get if they were coming to the left. 
So everything on the right side is going to suddenly the the, the high value, value trees is going to be higher. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, and then, you know, once they're sitting next to you on the right, then you take one step with them on the right and, you know, you just work it up until you can do more than one thing at a time, you know, one step at a time. Okay, great. Good advice. Any other questions? Well, I sure appreciate everybody coming tonight and joining us. It's been a lot of fun and Joey Spectacular. Killer job. Well, thank, thank you. Very, 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 very yes, thank you, Thanks, Joey. everybody, thank for being here. Great job. I'm always available for anybody that wants to talk about any training stuff. I love training. So. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, 